Kevin, welcome to the Guild of Dads podcast. Well, thank, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Now, I'm fascinated by what you do, and we first uh, linked up over on Twitter, which is one of the places where I often link up with people who share a similar interest to me. And what fascinated me about what you do is that you help children and young people uh, in terms of their uh, in terms of their confidence, and and you actually coach children and young people. How did you first get into that, Kevin? Well, I first started. Basically, I was a. Um, where do I start? I got into education and training, and was started working as a teacher, even in further education, over twenty years ago. And then I was teaching business and things like that. And then I went freelance and started doing training for different organisations, public sector, private sector. And it was then I started to I studied NLP, for mm. example. And I started to realise that I could do more powerful stuff one to one. In, in that time, it was kind of like powerful personal change work that I got into using NLP and the various other things that I added over the time over the years. And so that's when I started doing stuff one to one. And then when my daughter was born, when I became a parent, she's 18. Now, I started probably two or three years after that, working with children and specialising in working with children and their parents. And what I found was that they're a kind of an underserved population in a way because there are most, yeah, most people who work in coaching or therapy or counselling don't work with kids. They won't work with kids. Like they're scared of working with kids, which to my mind is kind of nuts because I find kids are fun and, you know, lovely to work with. Kids are actually easier to work with because kids make changes better just like you know when a kid breaks its arm the arm heals quicker well everything heals quicker the younger you are right if you're working with someone who's like 80 or 90 they're so much harder for them they're a bit set in their ways right yeah. so kids are the opposite of that um and yeah so it's, they're easier and and more more rewarding and as a, a parent as well you know it, it, it just kind of synergized with that so mm. for the last 15 years i've been specializing in one-to-one -one work working with parents children and parents when I, when I see kids 12 or under I always see the parents as well and then um, more recently I've started doing these programs for in parenting mm -hmm. uh, for parents themselves parents who want their kids to really excel in life in the, what, what, the most rounded way possible mm. and did you find that there was as you started off in this did you find there was a gap between what parents were kind of teaching in the home and the skills that kids were learning in schools and did you find that you were able to kind of begin to kind of fill that gap between where 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 uh, the home finishes and school begins, if you like? I'm not sure I've really thought about it like that. I think that um, you know it's always a big question about what schools should be covering because, on one level, I think sex education and relationship education and emotional well-being it's really good for schools to play that role. But then another level. It's like that could go too far and it's like hang on they could kind of encroach on the parents territory so there's always that tension isn't there um because most when i work with clients in a confidence coaching role they are uh, usually dealing with specific challenges usually about anxiety mm -hmm. which is kind of the opposite of confidence really um so they're dealing with being bullied or ex exam stress or finding it hard to make friends things like that which the school isn't really equipped to cope with and the parents don't really have the tools to help their child with obviously there's things parents can do but they've come to me because those things haven't worked right so um it's it's kind of i don't have really seen it in quite that way but i suppose that's how i'd articulate it mm. I, think, I think there's one example actually springs to mind when you say that about the difference between parents one of the things often kids are being bullied and the so they're being physically bullied so the kids being kicked or hit or you know elbowed every time they go past people in the playground uh, the, the corridor or whatever you know, I can remember at school that can be a really unpleasant, horrible experience. And you go, you know, waking up every day, sick to the pit of my stomach, not wanting to go in and all that stuff. And the 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 child may be scared to tell the teacher. The child may be scared to retaliate because they don't want to look bad. And sometimes they do tell the school, but then the school solution is always some sort of conflict resolution, discussion talking approach because that's what the school that's all the school can do right and that works sometimes and then oftentimes it doesn't work and the bullies just go along have their little kind of conflict resolution conversation go outside laugh and do it 
do it again, do it more. Mm. In which case then sometimes what the child needs to do is to actually stand up for themselves and retaliate physically even. And I'm not talking about, you know, 17, 18 year olds, I'm talking about young kids, right? Um, so sometimes my role is, is actually supporting the child and the parents with the parents' approval always in actually doing that. So that's a kind of example where there's a, uh, I'm perhaps doing things which would go against school policy. Although of course, what often happens is the kid stands up for themselves. Oh, guess what? The bullying stops. And sometimes the kid gets in trouble the parents go up to school and back the kid up and say, well, look, he's been being picked on for, or she, usually it's boys, he's been picked on for, you know, this number of months. We told it to hit the kid back, you know, we'll take the punishment, whatever. And actually often then the, the head teacher or whatever kind of on the quiet goes, yeah, fair enough. But of course they're not allowed to say that officially. Mm, yeah, and it's interesting because I think that the schools are, I think their role has changed in the last little while. And I think the the, the impact of technology and social media has meant that, the, the, the schools are being asked to kind of police things going on outside the school gates which actually aren't in their control they're associated with the school but they're not necessarily in their kind of direct control so there is this kind of dichotomy as to where mum and dad's responsibilities end and the school's responsibilities start and I think that I think sometimes that causes a little bit of confusion right, from what I can see because parents assume that you know when they send the little Johnny off to school, it's the school's responsibility, but actually ultimate responsibility lays with the parents and then you're delegating a part of that child caring part of the day, if you like, and education to the school, but ultimately it, it rests with you. But I think sometimes people look at school as, well, when they're at school and when they're coming home from school and to school, that's down to the school, but in actual fact, ultimate responsibility lays with you as parents, doesn't it? Yeah, one of the, because I, as well as, well, we'll talk about in a minute about turning my own life around and how then I help, you know, tra train my daughter and, and teach other parents to do the same. Um, I also I've studied, you know, parenting experts, but parenting experts at the high level. So there's uh, some people at Harvard who did a big study on how the, uh, you know, what, what, what is it that the kids that go to Harvard, for example, had in their childhood what did their parents do that have brought them to this place like really high achieving kids and one of the things one of the they identified a certain number of roles and one of the roles i can't remember what the name for it they gave it they gave it a name but basically was monitoring that stuff being on the case for the school and checking out what's going on and as soon as something was off intervening getting involved going to the school talking to other parents rather than just yeah if you just abrogate responsibility and leave it to the school and assume it will be all right you might be lucky but that, that the best parents don't leave it to that. Mm. That's interesting. That that's that's an interesting observation because my eldest child is is autistic. She's on the autistic spectrum, and 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 our experience was just that that you had to take ownership of the situation and you had to, to hold the school to account and you had to make sure that you got confirmation of what had been agreed in writing and mm. follow it up and make sure mm. it was done and mm. almost kind of you almost move from being a parent to almost like a project manager if you like and 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 some you know t teachers that will be listening to this will be, will be like thinking no don't tell people to do that because that creates more work for us sort of thing but i had to you know i, I as a parent had to, to 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 kind of let go of that idea that because some schools you know a lot of schools do have your child's best interests at heart but then other schools don't and I, and and I had to kind of let go of that kind of pie-eyed view of the of schools as being this happy, lovely place that really right. want your, the best for your children. And it, there was a point at which, when we were going through the diagnosis process and stuff, I actually had to say, right, okay, I need to look at this situation completely different to what I'm looking at. I still was working with the school and still having that two-way, you know, still being civil, still being polite and still being all those things. But I had to look at it from more of a like a like a business and a, and a transactional way which is a hard jump i think for parents to do what do you mean by a business in a transactional way because i think i think i looked at schools as being kind of uh when stuff goes wrong with schools i and in my experience i found that i was reluctant to stick my head above the parapet for fear right. of retribution or for fear of my child's car being marked or for, or yeah, for fear yeah. of, you know, um, something 
happening back at me or my child. But it reached a point in the end where when we were going through some difficulties, particularly with getting schools to do as they'd been asked to by local authorities and stuff, that I actually had to let go of that kind of fear, if you like, of sticking my head mm. around the parapet and saying, mm. right, my kid comes first and the school should be doing this and I'm going to hold them to account. And, and and once you kind of once I removed the emotional aspect of it, it became a lot more kind of business like and, and okay and actually we began to get we actually began to get somewhere and we actually began yeah. to get progress and things begin began to happen and uh, but I think a lot of parents I think are fearful of um, rocking the boat with schools I think I think that's, well, that's I, th- I think I parents yeah I mean I hear these sorts of stories very commonly from my clients I mean some of my clients do have had autistic clients and varying degrees and you know, well, other special educational needs or whatever and I do hear these stories obviously the parents that come to me are the more motivated parents because the fact they're bringing their kids to me so they're not the you know they're self-selecting population mm. um, but I hear these kind of stories a lot and I think that um, <clears throat> I agree that parents are, 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 can tend to be intimidated by schools because when we're kids we're intimidated by the the head teacher, you know, go to the head teacher's office, like, oh, and then there's adults outside the gate. That that's very hard because obviously they're the. Prof- we're dealing with two things. One, we're dealing with professionals, right? So people are often are de- are intimidated by dealing with accountants or lawyers or doctors or whatever because they're the professional, they're the expert, they're the teachers, they're the educationists, and then we've got that hungover, hangover from our own childhood of being scared of the head teacher. Um, so I think that kind of combines. And then of course we think, well, hang on a minute, if that if, I, if, I, if my child's card gets marked they're in a vulnerable position they're gonna you know they could take it out on them which i mean there could be an element of that i think actually perhaps it would actually work the other way their card gets marked as a kid to give more attention and help to right the squeaky wheel gets the grease so actually i think um in my experience uh, professionally and personally is that when you make a, a fuss in a, obviously a polite and respectful way um then actually yes that's a good thing mm. Yeah. So I would encourage all all dads to get over that and just uh, get down there and uh, do what needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 it's. Uh, you're right. I think it, it does come from those two two areas. But yeah, it's it's definitely something that I had to overcome personally. And 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 the thing is, is once you kind of cross that threshold, if you like, then you realise what you, you you sort of think. Well, why did I make such a big deal out of it in the first place? Because we're actually beginning to get somewhere. Which had I had I done this six months or a year earlier or two years earlier, uh, things would have been a lot better, sort of thing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so everything, the first time is the hardest. I mean, I, I, mean I, I went to see the headmaster at my daughter's infant school one-to-one. I wrote to the chair of the governors at my daughter's junior school over an incident, an issue, and I've written to the head at her senior school and, you know, a couple of times to complain about things other members of staff have done, etc. So, you know, once, once I've got the bit between my teeth I've no qualms about doing that now <laughs> you see this is a man with worldly wisdom that knows the score of being able to go through the uh, go through the system in terms of you know we're going to obviously delve into uh, the things that you see in terms of corresponding with the school interacting with the school communications with schools what would you what would you say the kind of sort of top tips that you'd give to parents in terms of keeping things on that level footing so to speak well i think putting things in writing counts for a lot because um that is uh you know there's a record right so then it's that is there's a hard to argue with. that's true in life in general isn't it and i think also um i wouldn't be scared of writing to the head of the governors of the school whoever's you know the governing board whatever they have in america um but but do it in a polite way if you do it in a if it comes across as a kind of you know these people are rubbish and idiots and i'm had enough of them and i'm pissed off you know that obviously they're going to dig their heels in and defend their staff right whereas if you say well look i've you know i've got great respect for these people and they've done this great stuff and they've been really good in x y and z way and you talk about that and this thing happened which i think was a real mistake or hasn't been addressed well or wasn't good and you make your case that way i found it always to be very positive i mean when my when my daughter was i don't know eight or nine there was a, a fair school fair uh, and and one of the things that I noticed that they have various things, you know, which are sort of illegal in this country. Like you know, you pay ten p, and then you can sort of pull a pull a, a, a stick out of the thing, and if it's a 
st- stick out of the sand and if it's a certain colour, you get a prize, right? So it's mm-hmm. kind of it's kind of gambling, but it's okay at that level. And they had things like that, okay, fine. And then they had a thing where it was the cards, they played the play your cards right, which is basically guessing higher or lower. And it was 50p to enter. And if you got to the end of the six cards and you won, you won five pounds. So it was pure gambling cash prize. And my daughter came to me and told me how excited she was and how she'd spent some money on this and she was really excited. And I, and, and I went and had a look and it was like the ki- it was like crack cocaine to the kids. And I thought, whoa, this is not okay. So I went and got whoever was in charge said, look, you've got, and they were like, oh no, I said, this, is, this is not okay. You're teaching kids gambling, right? At the age of flipping nine and 10. And they went, oh, okay, you're right. And they shut it down. Then when I wrote to the governors, obviously I talked about all the positive things, but I said, you know, this in my view is, is you shouldn't be endorsing gambling for flipping eight, nine, 10 year olds. And they said, you're absolutely right. We put policies in place, this will never happen again. But I wasn't attacking, I didn't, I didn't attack the staff. I wasn't vicious in what I said. I stuck to the facts and kept it very kind of business-like, not personal, mm. if you like. Mm. And, and, you know, because any school, the heads of the governors, the, the, the senior people, they're not idiots, right? Mm. It's, it's, it takes years and a lot of work to get there. So obviously quality varies, but they're not stupid people. And when you make a reasonable case like that, they're going to get it. And in fact, a similar one, with the, one of the ones with her senior school was, um, get political if you want, but it was, a, it was after the EU referendum, the Brexit referendum in the UK in 2016, which people may have strong views on one way or another, of course. But what I noticed was that one of the school accounts on Twitter, which was a history and politics account, started giving its opinions in the official school account about how terrible the Brexit vote was and the outcome was. And I thought, what? I thought it's okay for the teacher to have political views and of course to air them in whatever way, but it's not okay for them to put it in the school under the school's name because the kids, some of the kids will be seeing this, right? And you're like, it's, it's, it, it's crossed the line. Mm. So again, I didn't attack the individuals, but I flagged that up and it, it got dealt with. Mm. Yeah. So put it in writing and be civil, I suppose. They're the two key things. Yeah. And this kind of feeds into the whole role model thing as well, because I, I do, I, a lot of the content I put around, put out is around, you know, the importance of role models. And one thing that I've kind of noticed in, in some schools and not all, but some schools is there is a kind of, there is like a bit of a disconnect between there is a do as we say, not what we do attitude in terms of we're going to expect the kids to dress smart and turn up on time and hold high yeah, levels of excellence yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But then actually in actual fact that kind of some of the staff may not actually be following that themselves. So they'll be rocking up late yeah. for lessons or unprepared and whatever and stuff. And what yeah. we're finding at the minute, what I've noticed at the minute specifically with a lot of learning going to Google classrooms, in actual fact, the, the the parents in the house now are kind of like the virtual like uh like um we're, we're like a fly on the wall on the virtual corridor as it were of the school so you know you can see you can see if teachers are rocking up late to classrooms and stuff and that and it's been a very interesting insight i can say kevin in the last couple of weeks because whereas if a if a teacher was turning up late or whatever for a class in a in a conventional setting it probably wouldn't get noticed i mean it went on when i was at school but it probably wouldn't get noticed by parents because they're not you know there but i think with google classrooms and virtual schooling i think parents are noticing some of this stuff and they're noticing the teachers that are turning up on top and so i think that's to, to your point i think there is i don't think parents should be scared and i have done this to actually say to schools look you're holding us to quite high a high high standards here and we expect you to set the same example to the kids um, and but again i think it's something that culturally i think we're very scared to do that with institutions to say look you're going to hold us to a high standard we're going to hold you to a high standard as well you know and call it out when it's not happening so um but it does happen i think yeah and i've noticed that some teachers have been complaining about this and some teaching unions have been very upset oh but i don't want to be teaching by zoom or by ms teams because you know it means the parents are sitting it's like what are you doing with their children that you're afraid for if you're afraid for the parents to observe your lesson that's not what does that say but i also get that it's, it can be very difficult if you've got a very challenging class because i mean i have taught in schools a long time ago uh, for a short time and some of them were quite challenging inner city comprehensives and the idea of trying to teach some of those you know, 13, 14 year old groups, bottom set or whatever in maths, trying to teach them over Zoom and get those kids engaged, I think that would be, I mean, it'd be very, very tough. 
Mm. Um, so I have some sympathy for teachers, uh, but I think if you if you're doing things that you wouldn't want the, the parents to know about or to see, that's 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 if you're stressed about them watching it, so what are you doing that's having you you know mm. maybe think about that as a thing yeah. to reflect on. Yeah, what do you what are you finding um, in in your experience are the, are the things that are the biggest kind of challenges for for children and young people at the moment that you specifically deal with? Well, during lockdown, or you mean in general? Just in general, and and and, and maybe even well, how those have changed during lockdown. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. I mean, in terms of my confidence coaching, it is primarily about social interactions, and that could be bullying or it could just be not having many friends or finding it hard to make friends and feeling a bit on the outside of the group and then being shy about talking to people that's definitely the biggest one there is also stuff about you know exams and athletic performance for top sometimes with some top junior athletes um so there's 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 a range but it's definitely about social interaction primarily obviously at that time of life is when your social interaction is most important to you you know there's no time in your life where you care most about fitting in with your peer group than when you're 12 13 14 etc um so that's a and, and also you're thrown together with these kids at school where you don't necessarily want to be with them so it's like a real potent combination mm. um and i don't think it's changed too much during lockdown except there's been the extra challenges of being away from school and not seeing people and having to deal with stuff remotely that's kind of made it harder for some kids but easier for some others because mm. they've been happy to be at home more yeah um, i think that uh, in terms of more generally in terms of parenting i think that we've got the challenges today of obviously social media and technology etc we've also got and that what that's part of a bigger thing which is the drive for instant gratification so everyone wants everything now uh, we want you know amazon prime same day delivery or next day delivery or i mean i was uh, watching a comedy routine by this black american comic comic yes he was or chinese american comic yesterday and, and he was saying you know what can we where do we go next maybe we have amazon in advance like we want amazon to send me the thing before i know i want it amazon to use its <laughs> algorithms to read what i've got and then give it to me and then you know and have it like put the food in my mouth extract extract the feces from my abdomen you know before i even know like it's like almost this this going to this we was like we're going towards being in the movie the matrix right mm. at this degree of connectivity everything's done for us automatically now there's some benefits to you know i'm amazon i have amazon prime and i like you know using social media or whatever there's some upsides to all that of course but it's quite a tiger to be riding. And one of the things about it is every every social, well, every device, phone, iPad, whatever, is designed to be addictive. It's designed to maximize engagement. And every app and every service is designed to be addictive, designed to maximize engagement. Whether that's Fortnite, whether it's uh, social media, whether it's Netflix, all of them are designed to get you to spend as much time with them as possible. Now, these are, these are multi-trillion dollar industries, right? So they don't just kind of, guess at what's going to be effective they research it like their lives depend on it because they do right and so they are basically aligning all these weapons of psychology and technology and multi-billion dollar budgets on trying to get our kids to be engaged as much as possible and to feel good now that's where the the, the feel good now the instant gratification obviously getting the likes on instagram etc getting the feedback getting a, oh, i feel good check my phone check my phone now we as adults know how hard it is to resist that most of us right sometimes mm. The developing child's brain it is so much harder, which is why we don't let kids gamble or you know drink alcohol or take cocaine or whatever because they can't resist it. Anything like you know we can, so that's so much harder. And basically, what we're doing is 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 this experiment setting up a generation to not have any patience, not be willing to wait, and yet in all the areas, all the key things that matter in life, being able to wait and delay gratification is one of the number one predictors of success and fulfillment mm. so thinking i want it now you know, we all know get rich quick means you lose money uh oh in, in terms of health if i just want to get feel good right this minute i'm going to eat the chocolate i'm going to lie on the sofa and watch netflix the tub of ice cream i'm not going to go to the gym or eat the salad or whatever right because that's going to give me results down the line but i want to feel good right now or if they're in relationships well if i just I want to feel good so i want to i, I need a, a, a husband or a wife because i want to be with someone i'll just pick the first person who'll have me mm. and then because i'm again i want to feel good right now if i'm feeling a bit bored with them i'll dump them or i'll i'll have an affair or i'll watch pornography because it's all this instant gratification in terms of so so you know all the areas of life that matter want an instant gratification and being addicted to feeling good right now being unable to tolerate discomfort and have patience 
is is a, is a disaster basically yeah mm -hmm. i'll get my credit card out and spend today because i want to feel good today and i'll deal with the statement when it comes that is not a winning strategy mm. so we have to so part of what you're doing i guess is helping kids to kind of relearn a lot of these skills i mean i know De i know cal newport talks about this in his book deep work you know this concept of blocking you know bl time blocking and actually switching off devices or putting them in the other side of the house or whatever so that you can engage in deep work and we know from from that book and the studies that him and other people have done that there is a carryover when you're using technology so that you so say you're trying to do deep work and you're block out blocking out time for work that i think it's 20 or 30 minutes after checking technology your attention span goes down during those 20 or 30 minutes afterwards so there's a there's a spillover effect into your concentration levels do you find that that is have it do you find that that has an effect with with in your experience with the kids that you deal with well i think it i think it's always there i don't think it's not like when i'm doing you know let's draw a distinction between my confidence coaching it's often not that relevant mm -hmm. although it's something that i do advise them on on, on managing but then what I also noticed, I said, when I look at kids 12 or under, I always see the parents. And what I've been quite, as an eye opener for me, is seeing parents who are very qualified, educated parents. I remember this couple once who were both doctors. They're both doctors, right? So they you know, didn't know a bit about health, right? And psychology. And I told the mother that the nine-year-old being on the iPad so much, including before bed, was affecting her sleep and her concentration was not good for her. And she said, oh, can you tell her that? Can you tell the nine-year-old, the daughter that when you see her this afternoon? I was like, well, yeah, I will, but, but you need to tell her as well. Anyway, when I saw the nine-year-old that afternoon, the mother was in the room, the doctor. And when I said this to the nine-year-old in front of her, I don't normally have the parents in the room, but she insisted, right? It doesn't help having them there normally, but she insisted. She, as I told the kid this, the mother then said, see, listen to Kevin, listen to what Kevin's saying. And I'm thinking, what? Who's the parent here? What you don't, you don't need to persuade your nine year old that they shouldn't spend so long on their iPad. You don't need to convince them to stop using an hour for bed. Take it off them, set the limit, set the boundary, mm -hmm. right? Because they're a child and this is the most addictive flipping thing in their world that's been created specifically to be addictive and, and maximize engagement. And you think that you just asking them and giving them advice can overcome that at the age of nine? No, you've got to set the boundary. It's like asking them not to eat sweets. Well, please don't eat sweets before dinner, but, you know, letting them. It's like, no, you've got to set the boundary. Mm. And I've seen that a lot. And this is obviously, this, listen, these are engaged, concerned parents because they were paying me money and bringing their kids to see me. So this wasn't like, you know, they weren't latchkey kids, right? They were parents who were engaged and cared. And they were doctors. But, it, but I've seen that, again, it's kind of quite an extreme example, but I've seen that quite a lot where parents, it's almost like a, there's a there's a trend almost of being so concerned about little johnny's or little jemima's happiness and and often only having one child perhaps and, and being kind of like oh my little baby my bundle of joy she's my life he's on everything of then confusing love with letting them run right like not setting boundaries and not providing limits and it's almost like trying to be the kid's best friend rather than being the parent mm -hmm. and i think that, that is a trend that i'm seeing uh, which is a um unfortunate shall we say yeah it's funny you say that because I, because i think that i've noticed that as well when people talk about their kid as if they're an adult so they'll say so they'll say oh he's such a nightmare the amount of time he's spending on his ipad and you're like hang on a minute you're the one that's in control of that you get to decide you know the time limits on it and stuff and that but there's it's a really i don't know there's probably a word for it if you were to ask ask experts there's probably a word for it it's almost like this kind of seeing your child like an adult and oh he's a oh he's oh he's such a nightmare or whatever and just like well, hang on a minute he's not an adult he's a six-year-old I think it's a, I mean, it's a way of avoiding responsibility right like, mm. and taking charge and it's kind of abrogation of responsibility letting the kid do their own thing my advice to parents my rule of thumb is when it comes to technology you should be, aim to be in the five percent strictest parents about technology that's my rule of thumb because i think the vast majority are storing up problems Mm, yeah i don't think it's good yeah so so the ability to delay gratification i mean there's actually i say i said about it predicting there's there was a i don't feel aware of the experiment the marshmallow test have you heard of the marshmallow test yeah i have yeah. yeah yeah so you know that's kind of the gold standard for it you know where they did it with stanford in the nursery the stanford kids in the 70s for listeners who haven't heard and they basically took these toddlers three four five and they said 
they took them in a room and said, here's a marshmallow, or it, or it could be something else, but let's use a marshmallow as an example. Here's a marshmallow. This is for you. You can have this anytime you want. And if you wait, I'm going to go out of the room. And if you wait and I come back in 15 minutes and you haven't eaten the marshmallow, you can have a second one. So you can have one now or you can wait and have two. And it's very hard to resist that temptation when you're that age. And some kids managed it and some didn't. And then they followed them up over decades. And the ones that had resisted the temptation and waited and got their second marshmallow had better outcomes academically, friendship-wise. Um, they, they were much less likely to be criminals. They were more like, less likely to cheat at games when they were children and adults. And they had better outcomes in terms of health, finances, relationships, career, flipping everything. Mm. So it's a huge... It maps across, and this has been now replicated across all different socioeconomic groups, different races, different ethnicities, different parts of the world, etc., um, and and different age groups. So you can do this experiment. One of the things I, I, I teach, so I said, you know, is to do this with your kids. If their toddlers use sweets or whatever, and give them the fifteen minute thing, like it was originally done. If they're a bit older, offer them ten dollars today. So you can have ten dollars today, you can have twenty dollars next month, or you can have ten dollars today, you can have fifteen dollars next weekend or whatever in a week's time and let them make that choice. So they get that tension between the instant gratification or waiting and getting a better reward. Now, the good news is some kids will pass that, or you know, quotes pass. Some kids will choose to delay, and that's great. And you reinforce it, and you praise them, and then you do more of it, right? And you talk about how valuable it is in life and what a great skill they've got. And some kids won't. Some kids will go, well, I'll just have this thing now. I'll have, eat the marshmallow, or I'll have the 10 quid now. And that's okay too. You don't shame them for it, but you say, okay, fine. And you give it to them and you say, do you know what? And then you talk to them about the theory and why it's really valuable to be able to wait. You say, let's do it again next week. And then you can see what you want to do then. And, and, and so you give them a bit of coaching and then you repeat and then they quickly get better at waiting. And then you can reinforce it and amp it up and do more, you know, make it more extreme. And that sort of things. So they develop that muscle. Mm. And, and that I think is one of the most, uh, that, so, you know, really that's something that I teach parents to do with their kids. I think that's one of the most, one of the i've got five key foundations that i i talk about and that's one of them for, okay. for having a for, for life because it's going to help you in every area and i you know i was terrible at that right maybe we'll maybe we'll talk about that in a minute i was terrible at that and it got me into all sorts of trouble but now i've turned it around and i'm totally different yeah so it can be learned it can be trained it can be improved yeah and this plays into the habit forming sections of your brain and stuff as well doesn't it your your brain's natural ability to create create habits and and also this concept of no x before y you know what, what we would often you, and you find this over christmas periods particularly when you're like actually it's it's christmas so we're going to kind of take off some restrictions around um kind of tablet time or tv time whatever it's going to be and then you sort of just before you get you know they go back to school you're like actually right we need to start getting them into bed at a, a decent time again and we need to start actually putting these restrictions back in and whatever and actually you don't have any time on this till you've done your homework and so it's that no x before y concept isn't it yeah so i think i think again that is absolutely so one of the things is homework before tv or whatever it is you know homework before netflix would be a, a, a great rule of thumb as well mm. um it's the same principle mm it will serve you well in life because yeah. we as adults know that if we go oh no i'll do my work after i've watched netflix it doesn't happen <laughs> <laughs> no this is a thing and this is a funny thing you see these parallels and you're like actually i'm telling my kids to do this and actually i'm not doing it myself so it becomes like a positive feedback loop well it does because the thing is you you actually actually if i'm telling them to do this and i'm not doing it myself then i just i don't i'm not being a role model i'm not actually no. Leading by example, a I'm just being an idiot. Speak louder than words. Yeah. Action speak louder than words every time. Yeah, and that's so we have to live it. Doesn't mean we have to have it perfect because obviously all mm. of us as parents go, "Oh my God, my life isn't perfect. I'm teaching my child crap habits." Because yeah, we all are, right? We're mm. all going to do that. But you can turn it around. But the answer to that isn't to just throw your hands up in the air. The answer to that is to go, "Okay, let me take a step," and actually maybe even teach my child that I'm doing it. So maybe even say to my child, "Do you know what? I realised." that I've been spending more money. This is what I did with my daughter. I've been spending more money than I earned and borrowing and getting myself into debt. And that's not really, doesn't work. And also it's not a good role model for you. Good example. So I'm changing that. I'm going to you know, save a bit more money or 10% more a month or whatever it is. I'm making this change. So, and I'm telling you about it now and I'm going to do that. And then you start being a role model and living it. You're also role modeling the fact that you can be humble and, and admit that you've made a mistake and you can learn and change and improve. I mean, there's, all, there's so many great lessons for mm -hmm. the child. And just be, you have to be a bit humble and be willing to admit that you've done something that didn't work so well. But, you yeah. know, that's that's fine. 
showing that to your kid means they can admit things and learn and grow and move forward as well mm, i love that i really love that and that's one of the things i say to people to see let your kid see you make mistakes because then they can see that that's that it's normal for people to make mistakes and normal for people to get stuff wrong and normal for people to learn on the job and all yeah these, all so being, kind of being, a good, being a good role model doesn't mean pretending you've got it all sorted yeah that's actually that's not real that's yeah. not real at all yeah yeah and funny enough my um this is i i had a f- f- funny funny thing happen the other day i get i tend to get up early and i do uh, i do a meditation i do a bit of journaling uh work out on certain days and stuff and then my eldest came down the other morning and um she said she was fully dressed and stuff and she, with her school uniform on ready for her virtual classrooms and she said uh i, I said oh what have you been up to she said I've been up, I've done my meditation app, I've done my workout in my room and stuff and that, and I'm ready to have breakfast. And I was like, but it just illustrates that, it illustrates that when you're setting, that they're watching what you're doing all the time. They're yeah, watching yeah. how you start your day. And, and and if you're starting your day laying in bed, getting up late, you know, coming down to <laughs> stairs on the, back, on the back foot, phoning your hand yeah. and whatever and stuff and that they're going to copy that they're going to they're going to do what you're doing and uh it's a, you know it's it that you know that's not happened overnight i've been doing this for a number of years now but it just goes to show that you you as a as a parent have to be doing this stuff on a regular basis for a long time for it to sink into your kid's psyche and for them to think actually that's probably what i should be the way i should be starting my day you know what i mean well, i think that was perhaps one sort of uh, good segue into what the sort of choices that I faced actually when my daughter was young because in um, in 2010 I was in a situation where I was $110,000 in debt I was so £85,000 in debt personal debt on top of mortgages I was freshly divorced and unhappily single right and you know not in a good place relationship wise and I was also disengaged from my work I was you know I was I was helping people but I was it was like a grind for me at that time right and also my daughter was seven and I, so I faced a choice it was like hang on a minute she's learning this from me this is what I'm teaching her in all the ways you've just described this is what I'm showing her both consciously and unconsciously do I want this kind of future for her do I want her to overspend get in debt do I want her to have bad relationship and get divorced do I want her to be doing work that's a grind for her flipping no no a thousand times no right so it's like okay i'm going to turn this around for my sake and for her and there was a synergy then between me doing stuff for me and doing it for her like it synergized really well and i'm sure all parents all dads can find that think about it like that's okay that makes sense right and i am um, because you know some of my background was that my mum was 16 when she had me and my parent, my parents got married because she was pregnant. They got divorced very quickly. I lost all contact with my dad. My mum then got married again and divorced again two more times. So at the time I had my 18th birthday, my mother had been divorced three times, right? Mm. So in terms of, you know, chaos in my head about relationships and marriage and all that stuff, I mean, you know, it was, it was a world of pain in my perception and the stories in my head. Also, in terms of the ability to delay gratification, we're just talking about one of the things that helps people delay gratification is having a reliable environment as a child because if you learn if, that's why as parents it's really important we keep our promises to our kids because as a child if you learn that promises will be kept and therefore that you can trust the future then you think well actually yeah it's worth waiting for that second marshmallow because that second marshmallow will that's been promised will come whereas if you promises keep getting broken and things keep changing all the time and you learn well i can't trust the future will that second marshmallow ever come then it actually becomes rational just to eat the first marshmallow. If you're in a survival situation, if you're in a war zone or something, it's no good thinking about next year. You've just got to survive now, right? So it becomes rational to just think short term. And that may well be what, you know, three divorces by the time I was 18. I knew my mum loved me and everything. There was some stability, but it was also very chaotic in certain ways, mm. very unstable. And I was very bad at delaying gratification, and that showed up in the bad results in all the areas we just talked about. And so it was like, okay, that was one of the things when I started to go, okay, I you know, got coaching, went on courses, studied in depth, started working on myself and, and getting mentors and thinking about, you know, what, what is it that I'm doing that's creating these results? Because you know, all the results I've got in my life in terms of money and, 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 and work and, and, and marriage and everything, they're a result of the actions that I've taken. And the actions that I've taken are a result of the thoughts and feelings that I've had on the inside, my belief system, the thoughts and feelings, right? So what do I need to change about those things? So I found people who were getting the kind of results that I really wanted, 
and learn from them, of course, which is what mentors are, right? And did some you know deep work about that, uncomfortable stuff, faced up to a few things, and made that a turning point for myself and my daughter. So that you know now the debt's long gone, and I've got you know significant savings of cash which means that coronavirus doesn't scare me at all i've got significant savings and money invested in the stock markets of the world for a long-term future you know it's a complete return 100 180 financially mm. and i'm remarried my wife i've been together we've been together nine years now we're, we're you know we love each other very much we're very 100 percent committed to each other you know she's beautiful intelligent supportive loving she's a doctor you know she's a great woman you know if she'd met me 10 years ago she would not have been interested in me right <laughs> but you know well no she did meet me nine years ago what am i saying if she met me 12 13 years ago right yeah um and uh and and also you know my work i'm so much more empowered and engaged in my work because like you know i'm, I'm living it right it's like it's, it's, it's congruent now and when it comes to like this conversation about parenting and how to help our kids really knock the ball out of the park and do well in life i could talk about that all day right is it like i would go yep yeah, this is what i'm born to do i would talk to you about that all day for a week solid and you won't get you know i can fill all the sciences don't worry about that right because i'm i'm really it's like it's the right path for me yeah so i've turned my life around and then my daughter she's just she she just applied to oxford university you know i don't know if she'll get in it's really hard to get in but that's the kind of level she's playing at right and she um she's not I had lots of boyfriends I'm not talking about her relationship life but she's got her head switched on I would actually say she probably understands I would even go as far as to say she probably understands relationships better than most adults let alone most teenagers she's really got so I've got as a you know protective father with a beautiful daughter I've got no concerns I'm confident she'll make really good choices and get great results there and then financially she saves over 30 percent of her income into the stock market for her financial independence so this is an 18 year old, I mean, she was doing it, she was doing it for a few years now. This is a teenager putting money, which they could easily spend because she hasn't got a lot of disposable income at all, mm. putting th over 30% of her money into the stock market, money she will not draw on or benefit from directly for decades, right? Till she's in her 30s or 40s or whenever she's rich enough to retire, right? Now that is delayed gratification in action and that's her choice, right? Yeah. So, so I've what I've modeled for her, talked to her about my own financial mistakes and how I was, you know, borrowing money and spending money I didn't have and all that kind of stuff and how I turned it around and then going through that, doing that process and sharing with her as I went and being open with her about it and then teaching her about saving and investing and teaching her what I learned has set her on a trajectory financially, which is, you know, a totally different life to what she would have had if I'd have carried on modeling what I was modeling before. Yeah. You know, if I'd have been doing what, what she's doing since I was her age, my life financially would have been a completely different place and you know some people go oh money doesn't matter so that's only only people haven't got any say that that's bullshit because if you haven't got any and you're financially stressed everything else suffers it makes everything yeah. else harder whereas having money and having financial stability makes everything else easier yeah and it's, it's funny actually because i was re I, re I was reading a book about a year ago and uh they explained the con particularly in relation to mutual funds the concept of uh compound interest and when you kind of read that and you get your head around it, the first thing you think is, wow, that's amazing. And then the second thing you think of, why didn't I do that when I was 18? Start doing that when I was 18. Because <laughs> I'd be a multimillionaire by now. Well, But right, you, just, exactly. don't, but you just don't think that because kids don't learn. You're not taught this kind of stuff. This is right, the thing. you're not taught it. Or I was told to say, but I didn't have the psychology to hear it. You know, the, the, the cliche, when the, the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That information actually is around, but of course, if you're not ready, if, you, if you're just thinking about you know next week and only caring about young people's stuff and all you want to do is go out and party and meet guys and girls and all that sort of stuff, you're not thinking about the future because people did say this to me, but it fell on deaf ears. Mm. So the, so so the, the simple like, there's only one way to get rich, but there's only one way to be rich. There's, there's only one way, and it is to make more money than you spend. And to save and invest the difference right that's it is that flipping simple right most people do the opposite they spend less than they spend more than they um, earn and they borrow the difference right mm. it's really simple but that doesn't mean it's easy because if you haven't got the understanding you haven't got it a bit deeper than that if you haven't got the habits you haven't got a psychology you'll tend to go oh well yeah, i'll do that later mm. and i'll have my marshmallow now mm. that's why getting these habits and teaching our kids about these things is like the kind of it's like the matrix. I, 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 I seek to teach my daughter how the matrix, so she can see the matrix. Mm. Because the other thing is, 
we talked about earlier about you know how much we lead to schools and all that kind of stuff as parents if we leave our parenting to schools or to wider society that's a bad idea but also if we think about how to parent and we take our cues from what everybody else is doing consider that's a really bad idea as well now there's nothing wrong with being average there's nothing wrong with it by definition most people are going to be average right but here's the thing when it comes to what i call the four key, key pillars of life health wealth love and direction and purpose right the majority the large majority of people in western society are unhealthy they're overweight or obese the large majority of adults it's not bad or wrong but is it what you want for our children when it comes to money and wealth the large majority of people are in personal debt on top of any mortgages they have. It's not bad or wrong. Is it what we want for our kids? They're financially stressed. When it comes to marriage, to love, to relationship, partnership, whatever you want to call it, the large majority, we know, you know, we all know 40%, 50% of divorces end, uh, marriages end in divorce. But how many of those other ones that don't are happy? That's the large majority are either divorced or unhappily married or unhappily single. Mm. Again, it's not bad. I've certainly been those things, but it's not what we want for our children, is it? And when mm. it comes to direction and purpose, which doesn't have to be about work, but often it is, the Gallup, Gallup organization, the big polling organization do surveys on this, right? And again, the large majority of people are not engaged with their work. And in America, just the, 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 I'll give you stats on all these, but let's do it. In America, 67% of people are not engaged with their work, which you think that's only a third are engaged with their work, which seems really sad. And then you realize America's the best because in Europe, all the numbers are worse. And in the UK, 92% of people are not engaged with their work. They're either actively disengaged or just not engaged mm -hmm. so only eight percent of people who've got jobs in the united kingdom are engaged with their work you know so they enthusiastic they look forward to it they enjoy it they feel they're contributing they get something out of it they find it rewarding only eight percent so, so all those statistics health wealth love and direction the question comes which side do i want my child or my children to be on which side of those statistics it's not right or wrong it's not a moral issue but just which side do I want to be and the reality is if i just bring them up in an average way the way and, and with the beliefs and the thoughts of the average person they will end up with the average results which will be overweight in debt divorced or unhappily married and not liking their work mm. and that um, that's not what i'm up for mm. so in terms of that matrix though know, those those four key areas do you advocate having like a plan in each of those four key areas or just as a starting point starting to educate yourself on these different things do you think the change starts with the parents or do you think it works in tandem with the kids at the same time would you say so as a parent i think it's worth looking at all four of those areas because these are the four key pillars of life health worth love and direction and i think of them as pillars because if one of them is off the whole structure starts to be rickety right mm -hmm. so if your health is off it affects everything if your marriage is crap it affects everything if you're it's financially stressed it affects everything. you hate your job you know all these things knock on effect right so these are the, the main four key pillars of life and of course no one's got them perfect right but as we work on each of them it's worth taking stock and working on them and you share with your child because you know if you're a couch potato you know 50 60 70 pounds overweight guess what your kids have noticed that and they are learning from that that that's acceptable and okay now beating yourself up about it that's not the the, the answer either but think about getting some support developing a plan taking some actions and the actions could be quite small but share them with your child say do you know what i'm going to only have alcohol at the weekends or i'm only going to have desserts on saturdays or i'm only, you know whatever it is you're doing share it with your children because that will hold you to account like because then you will think i've made a promise so it's going to be much easier for you to keep it plus you're modeling for them a process of being willing to address issues and improve life which of course we want our kids to be doing mm. so uh, i think having plans in all four of those areas yes and then also and there's lots of specifics you can teach your kids in all those areas but the foundations like delayed gratification are what i probably most focus on because if as i said if you say to someone spend less than you earn and invest the difference they won't do it if they're everything under the foundations are, are rocky or if you say to somebody oh eat less cake you know it's very easy to say that you know i know i should eat less cake but when i'm emotional i want to eat cake you know it's, it's very easy to say but it's very hard to do if there's other stuff going on underneath so those things like delayed gratification things like understanding human nature and our our ancestral human nature and how that shapes the way we behave in, in modern society things like understanding uh, taking responsibility and ownership in life and realizing you know i'm in the driving seat and my kids are in the driving seat of their lives those sorts of things are absolutely essential foundations without those foundations in place we're trying to build those pillars 
on well you know weak foundations and that's when it's hard for people to follow the specific strategies mm. that's that's yeah and i think the, i like the way you talk about you know the learning about yourself because i think that one of the things that i've noticed particularly amongst dads specifically is and this is specifically in the mental health space as well is that there is this kind of tendency to say right we've got to talk about stuff and we've got to be more open about stuff but i think the second strand to that is being self-aware begin to understand your thoughts and emotions and how they work and what they're indicating to you and change your what i would call relationship with thought i think is is kind of quite important because once you begin to do that and once you begin to understand how that works in your own mind then you can begin to uh, teach your children about that as well and one of the things that you know my daughter went through before you know she was going through a particularly impulsive stage and so I was able to sit down with her and you know on a sheet of A4 paper and say all right this is your brain and your brain creates thought your thoughts your brain is like a thought machine you know and it just churns out thoughts indiscriminately you get to decide whether you act on those thoughts and it's the same for grown-ups it's the same for everyone and once they can actually begin to picture that in you know mm. then that then when their brain is saying to them oh you know um i don't know to do something impulsive then they're all that their awareness of how their brain is working is a lot better uh and but i think part of this is almost kind of learning yourself how these things work and then saying right absolutely this is one of the one of the, one of the, I talked about delay gratification and responsibility and human nature. But I didn't mention meanings and beliefs, which is one of the other five uh, foundations. Because the meanings that we create, the stories that we tell in our head, right? So the thoughts that we have and understanding the stories that we tell in our head are not the truth, mm. right? They're just stories. So if I think, oh, this person's bad, this person's good, this football team's the best, this music's better than that music, uh, red is better than yellow, you know, purple's a nicer colour than green none of these things are true they're just matters of opinion right they're stories and that applies to flipping everything and it's why a great metaphor is you know two people can go watch a movie one person loves the movie one person hates the movie well guess what they watch the same flipping movie the movie was no different but their experience was completely different because of their thoughts and their perceptions and their the meanings their interpretations of what was going on in the movie what the character should have shouldn't have done and what the director should have shouldn't have done and all that stuff so once you start to see that like you say it's like the meditation thing, you're stepping back from all the thoughts and being the observer of the thoughts and being able to go okay i've got all these thoughts but those thoughts aren't me i've got some choice about how i think about things and how i relate to things that's a superpower mm. and that's something that's been that was huge for me and yeah my daughter knows about it i made sure she flipping knows about that and understanding that just because you think something doesn't mean it's true because we create these uh, narratives in our head and they become prisons we become trapped in them and we just think well that's the way it is and it, you know the movie is a great example or obviously think about two kids brought up on different sides of the world a child brought up in china a child brought up in california probably can have very different views of certain aspects of society and the world and the way things should be and they won't even realise that they've got different views. It will just be kind of like totally normal to them. It will be the water in which they swim. And um, But being able to like unpack that and go, oh, that's just a point of view that I've got or a, thing that, a thought process, a story that I tell myself, it may not be the absolute truth. That is a superpower because then you can be more flexible in your thinking and in any situation that you need to deal with in life, being able to be more flexible is going to put you in a stronger position. Mm. And I think as well, I think as well is people like sometimes my wife will say to me, "Yeah, that you go, you're going too deep. You're going too deep, and she's not going to understand this stuff." But my experience is they do. They do pick up stuff that's more. You, we we don't give kids enough credit, I don't think, for being able to get their head around yeah. stuff which we that think absolutely. is too complicated are- for them to get their head around. And what I found what I found recently is like. You know, my eldest came out with a statement the other day. She said, "Oh, I need to do this because I'm a big thinker." You know, she knows she, and and so I explored this with her. And I said, "You know, when we went for a walk the other day, I said, oh, so what do you think about?'" She said, oh, "I think about this. And I think about that." And I said, "I said that's all right because when I was your age, at your at your age specifically, these are the things I I used to really go into depth about different things I used to think about." I said, and I said, and that's not about you know that's. That's not a bad thing. I said, but it's amazing, sweetie, that you recognise that you're, you've got the insight to understand that you are a big thinker. 
Because most, yeah, so, most adults don't even know that, do they? Well, no, indeed. It's like what you just said about developing awareness as a, as a man, as a father, didn't you? Just now about awareness of our emotions and everything. And that, again, that's, it's all about awareness, awareness of our thoughts, awareness of the fact that they're just stories in our head and being able to step back and have some... When we've got awareness, we've got... Basically, if I've got a negative thought, a negative story, like, you know, I think I'm ugly or I think I'm stupid, for example. Take a simple example, right? If that is outside of my conscious awareness and I'm believing it deep down but I don't even realise it's basically got me by the balls. Whereas when I can see it and bring it out to my hand and go, ah, I've got this thought, this idea that I'm ugly or stupid. Okay, it's still there, but now I've got it in the, I've got it in my hand rather than it's got me by the, by the testicles, right? It totally changed my relationship with that thought and then I can look at things in a different way. Mm-hmm. So that awareness is, and it sounds, you know, it sounds like you're doing a great job of helping her fostering her awareness helping her develop that by reflecting stuff back to her mm. whereas you know it would be very easy as a sort of a knee-jerk parenting thing is to kind of criticize kids or give your opinion on what they've said or why and all this kind of stuff and oh you shouldn't think like that and oh you sure that sounds wrong to me and this sort of thing and that closes down their capacity to be aware whereas really what you want to do is just to let them come out of it and, yeah. and go, oh, right, okay yeah and i think as well is i think i always think that that's kind of a legacy from the maybe Victorian era and stuff that has kind of come down through the sort of generations to our own parents in this kind of concept of you can't think like that or you shouldn't think like that. And I think that's done a massive kind of disservice to to maybe my generation because it's meant that we've kind of ashamed of the way we think or ashamed of what we're thinking or, you know, and yeah. I think that and I think that it's taken, and I think our generation, I, I, I speak figuratively because I'm gonna I, I'm gonna say that you're of my generation, Kevin. But I think the uh, I think so, it, I, I think we're having to unravel this right now and and actually allow people to say to, to to really change their relationship with. I think people are having to change their relationship with thought, if nothing else, because we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's nowhere to run. You have to, you, there's there's nowhere to go but face down your face down your thoughts. So you know this kind of thing i think i mean i think i would say something about that i think that it's um that whole sort of shame and making certain things taboo has its downsides definitely like what you've just been saying i was thinking it's also worth noticing that taboos and shame have their in society have their upsides as well Mm. because they kind of provide a structure and a guidance so it's not just, I mean, Victorians, yeah, but this would be true around, around the whole flipping world, right? Um, that there would be societies probably with a lot stronger taboos than, than, than Western society these days. But that can actually be a, a value because it like gives people some parameters and some clarity. Mm. And it's almost like one of the challenges that we, and certainly if you went to tribal societies, you find lots of big, vicious taboos that would be viciously enforced sometimes, right? But one of the challenges that we've got is that because we are... Uh, basically hunter-gatherers in terms of our brains and our bodies. We're still hunter-gatherers evolutionarily, but we're living in this so different thing. It's like we've got this amazing freedom of being able to reject taboos and be free of them and all that kind of stuff. But then it's like, whoa, then we're kind of a bit all over the place. Where are the boundaries? Where are the lines? Mm. Where do I go? What should I do? Should I get married and have kids? Or should I just, you know, take drugs every weekend and party? Because that's what some people on social media said they enjoy it. I don't know. It's like, it's like um, there's a, it's almost like we, 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 we've lost some things in some ways from that guidance. So I, I, I think that navigating that freedom is, it's really great to have that freedom. I wouldn't want us to lose it. And it's great. I'm glad we've got it. And navigating that presents its own particular challenges, which humans in history, you know, no other time in human history have we really had to deal with. So that's what I, and I, uh, hey, that is getting more, not less. So our kids are going to have to deal with even more of that, which is why then these thinking skills and the awareness and being able to delay gratification and understanding human nature and our ancestral hunter gatherer brains and all that stuff, all those things are even more important for them mm. than they were for, for certainly our fathers uh, and, and even for us, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And we, and it could be a lot, very, very long discussion, but I know these are the sort of aspects that we touched upon before we came on air as well, actually, in our, in our pre-show chit-chat. Kevin, it's been a wicked conversation and we've delved into quite a few different, uh, different kind of areas and, you know, how we can really kind of support our children and young people as they grow up into adolescence and adults and stuff in our conversation today. So I appreciate you... Uh, coming on and speaking to me what is the best way for people to find out a bit more about what you do 
uh, and to link up with you, maybe send you a message or whatever? Well, the best thing to see more of what I do is I've got a free video training for parents, which they can get by going to parenting secrets of the one percent.com. Mm-hmm. That's parenting secrets of the one percent, all, all letters, O N E one. So parenting secrets of the one percent.com. Uh, and they can see free video training talking about the things we've just been talking about. Uh, and if people want to follow me on probably Facebook is the, the, the best one, uh, where I sometimes post videos, etc. Uh, then it's uh, they go well how would you find it on facebook well it's facebook.com slash the kevin birch okay. the kevin birch b-u-r-c-h right. uh, or they if they just put kevin birch advanced parenting program in the search bar on facebook i'm sure they'd find it as well excellent okay and i'll link all this up in the show notes and stuff and that as well one last question for you sir before i send you on your way uh, and this is a question that i don't prime any of my guests for but i know you've listened to the podcast so you may well remember it what is the thing in life that gives you meaning kevin well, I, yeah, I have this podcast uh, and some of your podcasts, and I have heard this question, and it is parenting. I mean, I think that that is the number one thing. And, I, you know, I'm very lucky that that's how I make a living. That's what I do with my day. I think that, I mean, it, there's many things. We, I mean, we all get fun meaning lots of different ways. But the thing about parenting, you know, being a father to my daughter is obviously informed by my own experience, not knowing my father, not how well, I met him when I was 25, right? But not having that consistent thing and wanting to provide the kind of thing for her that perhaps I didn't have mm-hmm. and then wanting to provide that for other children and help other parents do that for other children that is the thing that mm-hmm. brings me most fulfillment um and and the great thing about that then also because that is such a broad topic actually that means that yeah it talks about stuff about relationships and personal development and psychology and all these other things which I'm also very interested in all kind of fall under that umbrella so that would be you know if you if, if we when it's all over, well, obviously we've met, right? But if we were, if it's all over and we just bumped into each other in a pub and got chatting, if you got me on to parenting and child development and personal development, you wouldn't shut me up, right? That's what I love talking about. That's what I love doing. And, and when I, the other interesting thing is about, I noticed about how you can tell, you know, it's, it's, sometimes people actually struggle, and I did for a long time, to know what they're really into. And one of the clues is to, because actions speak louder than words, is to look at your own behaviour. And what I've noticed, not only what I like to talk about, but also the kind of things that I will go off and do straight away. So when I read something or see something online about parenting or something that I think I could use with my daughter or one of my clients, I will go, oh, that's really well. And I'll go and put it into action straight away. Like it happens. No one needs to remind me. I don't need to like, oh, I suppose I better do that one day when I get around to it. You know, yeah, when it comes to doing the gardening, that's what I'm like. But when it comes to the parenting thing, flipping, I'm on it straight away. Um, So because I find it inherently, innately fulfilling and it brings my life meaning. Mm, I love it. I love it. That's an excellent, excellent answer. And I had a suspicion that it was going to be something along those lines before I asked the question. <laughs> Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me today. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bid you a farewell. But uh, it was a really great conversation, and I'm, and I'm glad to have linked up with you, sir. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks very See much. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.